uh, speaking with Victoria Smolkin uh, about her book, A Sacred Space is Never Empty, A History of Soviet um, Atheism. Um, and I suppose the first question I wanted to ask you is just how you became interest interested in this uh, subject, in this topic, and, and what moved you to uh, begin researching um, the subject. So the, f the main reason was because one of the big um, interpretive frameworks in our field is this idea that communism is a total form of totalitarian politics and uh, or a lo another analogy that's used um, usually as a metaphor, although sometimes not, is that communism is a religion. And um, I found that very interesting, but one of the questions that came up for me right away was, if it's a religion, how did it actually manage and interface with with other religions, right? Or, um, or if it's not a religion, how did it manage religion as a as a kind of political and social phenomenon? So, um, when I began to look at that, there was some literature on the early Soviet period, um, and what I found really interesting was in particular the the question of everyday life um, and how um, the Bolshevik um, project engaged with everyday life and especially those moments that were just a kind of permanent feature of the human condition like birth and marriage and death and those being the moments where um, religion is especially uh, powerful as a kind of framing and meaning making um, phenomenon. So. So I started looking there, and I, you know, ended up in this uh, in this history of the red rituals, right? Like the mm -hmm. socialist baptisms and weddings and funerals. Um, and initially, what I wanted to uh, to um, look at was how that story continued, because they basically stopped the Bolsheviks stopped working on that project of making Bolshevik replacements for Christian rituals. But I knew because my family's from there that there was this peculiar wedding ritual that my parents actually had in the 1970s. And, um, you know, so I knew that there was a Soviet version of a wedding, and at some point it had to have been agreed upon and created. And so I went to Moscow, and that was initially what I was going to research. It ended up only being one chapter in the book. Um, and the reason for that is that when I went to research that, I ended up at a place called the Institute of Scientific Atheism, and um, looking initially for these rituals. And what I realized, what I found at the archives of the Institute of Scientific Atheism was just, you know, hundreds of files of thousands of pages of um, essentially what you know what I call professional atheists right yeah. these are people who whose job it was to produce and disseminate atheism um, talking about things like the meaning of life and how to come up with the Soviet answer to death um, and I found these these um, these conversations so compelling in part because of their seeming sincerity that you know mm -hmm. they weren't being ironic they weren't being cynical they were really just like grappling with these human questions these existential questions at the very heart of the human condition but in these kind of committees right, uh -huh. in these bureaucratic committees so I found myself just I couldn't tear myself away I just read these transcripts and I kept thinking okay I gotta get to working on my real project which is about these rituals but, you know, I just kept kind of reading and reading and reading and realized that really you can't understand the rituals without understanding that bigger edifice of atheism and what they were trying to do. Um, and then I just switched, you know, I just kind of finally conceded and followed my research process and shifted the nature of the, the question to the bigger question of, of atheism. So I actually had a question about atheism, but since we're on the topic of rituals, uh -huh. um, I. I'm going to jump out of order, uh, and I'm going to jump ahead to that chapter. And one of the things um, about that chapter and um, and the ones preceding it and following it is um, that it's very clear that they're struggling, mm -hmm. that they are sincere, uh, that um, that uh, they operate, and, and I'm thinking about some of the vocabulary uh, that you cite, uh, say, by the uh, head of the Ideological Commission, mm -hmm. Leonid Ilyichov, right? Yeah. They're yeah. struggling, they're, they're um, 
speaking in a on certain occasions in a um, different kind of r register, mm -hmm. language register. They're talking about human needs mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to all the familiar, you know, familiar uh, formulaic language that we would encounter uh, mm -hmm. in other published uh, sources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, this is one of the things that caught uh, caught my attention because uh, it's been ever since the archives opened, it's been something of a cliche that the archives uh, speak in the same language as the press. Yeah. Um, yeah. That we haven't sort of discovered anything that yeah. is different from, and uh, we've discovered many factual things, mm -hmm. but, but mm -hmm. this sort of mm -hmm. language register is, is, is very much like the press. And I was stunned that they are speaking in, um, in a different kind of manner about human needs, mm -hmm. uh, about the need for yeah. meaning. Yeah. Um, so my question is, they, you showed that they failed, and they mm -hmm. failed time and again. Mm -hmm. Why do you think they failed, despite mm -hmm. the sincerity? The sincerity, yeah. despite uh, mm -hmm. despite their sense that yes, this this is serious. Uh, this is this is about the meaning of life, mm -hmm. and this is about giving people something. Right? If we think about death, right? Mm -hmm. It's about giving people something. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, the 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 line in Ilichov that stood out for me is where he says. Uh, that we want to find a way uh, to deal with sorrow and mm -hmm. grief, mm -hmm. right? We want to find a way to mm -hmm. deal with human mm -hmm. feelings, mm -hmm. with emotions, the way that the church is mm -hmm. able to do, but we are not. Mm -hmm. But why did they fail nonetheless? Yeah. I think one of the things, one of the complexities of, of trying to tell this story and make an argument is you do kind of have to adopt a more or less clear position, right, which is in this framework, success or failure. Um, and I think in some ways, well, I think in the main way they failed, uh -huh. right, um, when that's the, the, the right. position I take in the book. Um, and, that, and by that I mean they failed on their own terms. They, uh, they believed themselves to have failed because the criteria for their success were very specific. So the criteria for their success was they wanted to create um, a community of believers who had conviction, athe what they called atheist mm -hmm. conviction. Um, and when I say community of believers, I mean atheist <laughs> believers, right? And, and that that community of, of atheists with their atheist conviction would have the kind of consciousness and clarity to understand why they, as conscious, convinced atheists, could not allow their mother-in-law to baptize their child, right? This was the level, that was the criteria of their success, was that a communist and an, had to be an atheist and that that atheist could not allow for these um, violations of their ideological commitments to take place, not just for themselves, but even within their vicinity. And then moreover, a convinced atheist would not be um, would not be a passive atheist, but an active atheist, meaning they would have to start proselytizing, uh -huh. right? So that was in a way that like, you know, that was how it was supposed to spread, right? Is that once you were convinced, um, you would become somebody who would spread that conviction to your family members, to your friends, right? To anywhere you saw people continuing to operate in ways that were not um, according to the, the faith, right? Um, so according to those principles, right, I don't think any religion, including, you know, Christianity has been successful, right? right? Because Christianity never managed to monopolize all of private and public life and all of politics and all social institutions. It's that um, the failure was because they did not compromise and they were unwilling to accept these um, deviations from uh -huh. their principles, whereas you know a lot of religions they accommodate, right? Uh -huh. They they work to integrate cultural traditions that were not in the dogma into the practice in order to become, um, you know, to become a kind of authentic part of that cultural community, which is why it can be kind uh -huh. of universalized into different, you know, different um, areas. But the Bolsheviks, they, or the, the, the atheists, um, I should say, um, this wasn't strictly a Bolshevik enterprise, um, they really wanted to remake the world in their image. And they were really unwilling to accept um, a kind of plurality 
of being Soviet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, of course, as you know, there was a plurality of right. being Soviet, right? So in some ways, that's, I mean, the, the story I tell in the book is at the end, they're the ones who are this kind of, they're perceived to be marginal and sectarian because everyone else kind of accepts that there is a plurality to being Soviet and they don't actually put that much weight into these, um, into these projects anymore, these ideological projects. But the, but the ones, you know, who were charged with making atheism real in the Soviet Union, um, you know, they perceive themselves to have failed. So, you know, why did they fail? You know, their interpretation was, well, there were multiple. <laughs> One, because the state didn't give them enough resources. Um, two, because they didn't, they couldn't come up with compelling enough replacements. Mm -hmm. Um, three, because they never actually outlawed the alternative, right? They allowed for the church to continue doing its own, you know, rituals and so on. Um, so they were still in competition. They had to compete within a restricted marketplace. Certainly the church had restrictions on it, but it was still present. Um, and then I think the, so, so the, there was the kind of, and then finally, their estimate was that, you know, the people failed them, right? That was ultimately that the, the people didn't live up to the kind of great hope that was placed on them. You know, their argument was, you know, we brought you the truth, we brought you the opportunity, we brought you the enlightenment, and all you want is, you know, televisions and, you know, fancy weddings and, you know, Western records and all this kind of consumer, what they called even spiritual consumerism, right? Um, you know, the kind of, um, and in the 70s, that's where it lands, right, is that they, the, 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 the main enemy of this project is the indifferent youth, the spiritual consumer who's willing to both have the socialist wedding that they create, right, the Soviet wedding, but then also go to church and have the religious wedding, because why not have both? Right? So even when they succeeded at creating these replacements and they were widely adopted, it didn't exclude the alternative. So from that perspective, t they, they perceived it to be a complete failure because the point was to exclude. Yeah. Would, would you say, would you, um, would you, would, would it be correct to say that uh, you know, the, li the, the reasons you gave, their reasons, you mm -hmm. gave, right? then, but you gave your own reason as well. Mm -hmm. Would it be correct to, uh, summarize your reason um, as follows, that, that uh, the ideological authorities were unable to accept uh, fallible humanity, mm -hmm. sinfulness, mm -hmm. in the way that the church is mm -hmm. able to accept, yeah. accommodate, yeah. forgive, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it, it, they were simply unable to deal with human imperfectibility, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and that is what drove them to that absolute absolute maximalism mm -hmm. and a search mm -hmm. for perfection mm -hmm. uh, and that is where the kind of the roots of of, of failure on their own terms uh, might might lie yeah I think that they believed they they were true believers I mean I think the atheists were in a way the truest <laughs> believers of all right like they they right. believed that the great gift of of the ideological kind of project and utopia was um, was was real and that if it was accepted by the community that you know that there there was no question for them that this was something that could exist in principle um one of the reasons that they you know they said okay well people first of all people don't want uniform answers to all questions that they admitted that and that was something that came to them as a result of studying you know these sociological right, studies right. right so they said okay well first of all we can't you know, we can't enforce uniformity, right? We can't make make everyone accept the same answer to all the same questions. Um, so that's something that they kind of accepted as not necessarily a defeat, but as a compromise. Um, but I think that they they looked at the world through a certain um, a certain faith and optimism, you know, um, and they couldn't reconcile themselves with the the next generation that kind of didn't see the world in their kind of heroic narrative um, so it has a lot to do with the way they perceived human nature 
Absolutely. And, I think yeah. I think they did. They perceived human. They, they perceived human nature as perfectible, and in fact, they were probably more disillusioned with the communist project than, in some ways, a lot of ordinary people. I, I'm thinking of one example in particular, um, because when uh, when I interviewed them, so I interviewed a lot of these professional atheists, and these were people who, the ones that I caught right because I was interviewing them already, um, you know, in the kind of first decade of the 2000s, right? Mm -hmm. From 2005 to 2000, say, 12, 15. Um, so they had come of age in the 60s. Um, and, you know, a lot of them were, you know, part of the, f the some of the first graduates of this Institute mm -hmm. of Atheism and then went on to make illustrious careers training future graduates of the Institute of Atheism. And one of the questions I'd ask them is, you know, when did you lose, some of them never lost their faith, but a lot of them did. And I said, well, you know, when did you in lose communism. your faith? In, in communism, but in atheism. Mm -hmm. You know, when did you kind of become disillusioned with the project? And one of them, um, one of the, one of the most thoughtful people that I spoke with about this, um, said, "Well, I went to Siberia on a research trip, and I witnessed um, a, um, I witnessed a trial of a local community of uh, Baptists, and these, you know, this Baptist family was, you know, on trial for some kind of minor infraction. I think something to do with the children, actually, now that I'm thinking back to it. With the parents abusing the children or not letting them be, join the pioneers uh -huh. or something like this. And, um, and then the community, you know, all spoke against them. And he was mortified by this, right? He witnessed this and he was like, this is completely against our constitution. If these people don't want to join the pioneers, they don't have to join the pioneers. And so he, as a kind of true believer, right, sees this as a kind of a failure of the system. And he goes to um, um, uh, Emil uh, Lysavtsev, who was in charge of the religious, religious affairs in the Central Committee, is the curator of atheism and religion. And he says, you know, I witnessed this travesty and this family was humiliated and these poor children and, you know, the community just all spoke against them. And this is, you know, this is, this is against our constitution. These people have their rights and, you know, we shouldn't violate them. And if we want people to be on our side, they have to come voluntarily, kind of, we can't, you know, do this. And, and Yusafsev said, because Yusafsev is a politician, right? He's not an ideologue. He said, he said, constitutions are for foreigners. And he said for him that was such a disillusioning moment, uh -huh. you know, because he believed that, like, you know, we have the Constitution, people have freedom of conscience, but we will bring them to our side through the truth, right, through the value of our truth. And instead, you know, he's being told cynically that even we don't believe in our truth, you know, and then we're only kind of projecting this uh -huh. project, you know, for somebody else's consumption. So I think, you know, they were in a way the most kind of disillusioned by this system because they believed it to its most radical conclusion which was giving up all alternative faiths you know there was no other truth out there for them can you talk a little more about about these people you call them atheist cadres yeah i mean who, sort of do you have a sense of their background sure. or um who were they and mm -hmm. what, how did they get involved in this yeah well they're really uh, they're a very interesting group um, sociologically, um, so there were there were a few types, and um, one type. So I, I would say, okay, there's there's a kind of uh, I think I talk about this in the book. There's kind of three three general types of ways that people end up in atheism. Uh, one is the the kind of old atheists who become who are kind mm -hmm. of re um, um, remobilized for the project when it's revived in the late 50s and 60s. So these are people who were in the League of Militant Godless, right? And they're the militant ones. They're really, you know, kind of um, all in without any nuance, right? And for them, it's a political project. Um, Joining them in the late 1950s and 1960s are new category for this project um, um, are former priests. Mm -hmm. Right, so these are people who had renounced the faith, usually coming out of Orthodox, the Orthodox Church, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, you know this was considered a big coup, right? When when a when a priest or you know right. a, a theology professor, one of the main ones was a theology professor from the Leningrad um, Theological Academy, Osipov, his name was, and he 
you know, they would publish a Pravda editorial that said, you know, I've now seen the light and I'm breaking with, the, you know, the darkness of the church and the priests are all corrupt and so on and so forth. So they became this kind of apologists in a way for mm -hmm. atheism. But most, those were, that, that was a minority of people. Most people who found themselves in atheist work were provincial Komsomol kids. Mm -hmm. um, and suddenly there would be, you know, this project is on the agenda now. And, you know, this Institute of Atheism is now opened. Um, and the society, the, you know, uh, Knowledge Society, which is the mm -hmm. main enlightenment organization, is recruiting. And they're saying, okay, so you're in the Komsomol and you've been, you know, one of them, for example, was, you know, in um, Ivano-Frankivsk in Ukraine, and he said that they came to him and they said, well, you know, we've been reaching out to you to go um, round up the Jehovah's Witnesses to go vote in the elections, <laughs> you know, um, because there would be, they would, Jehovah's Witnesses wouldn't vote, right? And so his job was to try to get the young people to join the Komsomol, right, to kind of bring them over to the, 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 right side and then to get them the, the proof that they were fully all in was that they would vote in the elections um, these former Jehovah's Witnesses and he had apparently had some success in this and so they said you know you wanted to get an advanced degree and there's this new institute uh, opening in Moscow at the Academy of Social Sciences which is basically you know the highest ideological training ground right it's basically the party's think tank and that's, a, you know, within that, you have this new institute, and it's got no students. So if you want to be, you know, you're a provincial, ambitious, Komsomol guy or girl, um, although initially it was mostly guys, yeah. um, the, the, you know, you, suddenly you have a, a, a all-expense-paid trip to graduate school in Moscow. And he said, you know, I didn't really care about religion, I didn't really think about it, I didn't know anything about it, but, you know, I was going to go to Moscow and be in the party school and learn about it, because why not, right? And it was, for, for some of them, it was really a kind of career move, um, and then they kind of either got stuck there, or they really got interested in it, uh -huh. because in a way, this was the kind of great taboo, right? Because they were studying something that wasn't supposed to be there. And so right. they were getting access the to things, that right, that nobody else not only kind of wasn't allowed to learn about, but mo wasn't mostly aware of its existence, except, um, you know, because obviously their grandmother, you know, would take them to church. Or, but everybody, I think this is the interesting thing about the Soviet Union in general, because there's not this open exchange of information people think that the weird thing that they're seeing in their own immediate community is their weird thing in their own immediate community, right? So they know that there's some Baptists in their community, but that's kind of, you know, not normal, that's marginal. And, but what they don't realize is that there's weird Baptists in every community in some form, right? And so they kind of suddenly are allowed access into these worlds that are complete, you know, that have been completely close to them. And they're also reading what they call bourgeois sociology, right? So they're reading, um, you know, Weber and like, you know, things that other people don't get to read. So from that perspective, I think a lot of them genuinely became interested. Moreover, you know, eventually, and this is kind of the, um, you know, one of the chapters, the story that I try to tell is that, you know, the, this was a kind of sentimental education for a lot of them. At the end, they come out and, you know, they really think of themselves as, you know, religious studies scholars who are no longer kind of in it to convert, but to understand and to, um, and in fact, they see, they kind of spend more time trying to enlighten other bureaucrats <laughs> about why religion isn't a threat and they should kind of let it be than they spend trying to enlighten religious people about, about why they shouldn't uh -huh. be <laughs> religious. So it becomes this kind of interesting um, evolution. Uh, one of the um, things that was really uh, surprising and, I, and, and so insightful when, is when you discuss uh, common ground betwe between the church mm -hmm. and the state, uh, common ground in their battle against what both call superstition, mm -hmm. right? And um, uh, I just didn't expect to see yeah. uh, to see that uh, that kind of common ground. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, popular re religiosity yeah. and yeah. what that was like, um, yeah. right? Because we have these two big established. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Entities, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. and there is something between the cracks that seems yeah. 
right? That they're yeah. looking at both. Yeah. Both seem terrified yeah. <laughs> when they see yeah. it, right? Yeah. Um, so they're talking about the, when they're talking about the klikusha, the, the women. When they're kind talking of about the women and the miracles and the, and the right? right? So what? Yeah. What was that like? <sighs> yeah. Well, that's uh, so. So I think the for me those kinds of um, convergences in their interests are actually the most revealing thing about the nature of both sides because what it says so well, just to kind of summarize what you're I think what you're referring to um, you know in the one of the surprising turns in the story is that when the when under Nikita Khrushchev the the party decides to revive the atheist project they of course as a secular state that does not infringe on people's religious rights have to do this um, through the back door through back channels and one of the back channels is that is the church right so they go to the church and they have to have the church itself in a way start policing itself and saying you know okay if you're a priest you cannot allow this you have to register you know all rights in a way that they didn't have to do before um, there are all sorts of new taxes that are imposed right but in a way it ha can't seem to come from the state uh -huh. has to be seen as a kind of internal church reform and there's this great scene where the head of the council on the affairs of the Russian Orthodox Church which was the state institution created to manage church state relations and the patriarch are sitting down and the head of the um, of the church or I'm sorry the head of the the state institution the is council. saying we're going to um, you know you need to do this and also we're going to take the the Kiev monastery of the caves we're going to turn it into a museum and of course this spot is so historically and um, and and uh, religiously important and the patriarch threatens to resign which would be a huge international scandal right this is this was not this was not an acceptable outcome so what they do is that they come then they come to an agreement because he says well at least the, the the state representative says well at least control you have to control these superstitions that take mm -hmm. place he says one of the reasons we want to close it down is because these monasteries and these kind of pilgrim become pilgrimage mm -hmm. sites and mm -hmm. all of these people come and then you know they act you know backward and superstitious and crazy like they're possessed by demons right and and so you know this is why we're going to close it down and the, and he says well that's not a good enough reason because we also do not want those people at our monastery those are not you know true christian people those are you know charlatans and <laughs> you know um backward people and so you know we will make sure that they are you know that they behave themselves and we will make sure to kind of enlighten them to not you know behave in these ways that are contrary to not only the state's rules but also the, the rules of the church right and that was really interesting and then the miracles I mean I think w one of the fascinating again one of the fascinating revelations for me writing this and this is kind of where I um, in a way ended up in the book is that you know at the end of the day this is really about authority right this is about who gets to decide you know what is and isn't appropriate behavior what is and isn't a miracle um, and so for example this um, situation that I described one of the chapters begins with the story of this girl right, turns who supposedly to turns to stone right and then she becomes um, she's struck down by God for saying that she was for dancing with an icon at a party and then she turns to stone um, and then it becomes a pilgrimage site people go to see her and it becomes this kind of local um, event mm -hmm. and the church of course doesn't acknowledge this right because only the church gets to decide what's a miracle right? so it's again this issue is not about you know the sacred and the profane it's about authority and about contain have you know keeping the authority to make to draw those boundaries and I think as time goes on the state and the church actually realize that they have a much better chance of disciplining Soviet society together uh -huh. than they do of, of disciplining Separate. Soviet society separately and that's the big surprise uh -huh. which actually if we look at the current situation is shouldn't be a surprise at all right but and if you look at a lot of 
political regimes, right? Church and state work together to do that kind of disciplinary work. Um, but I think because of the ideological framing of communism and religion as, as kind of polar opposites, that was the, the surprising outcome for, for the Soviet case. Uh -huh. Well, speaking of um, uh, discipline, mm -hmm. um, uh, since I think we're running out of time, I uh, um, was wondering if you could recommend three books to our uh, viewers, yeah. to our audience. Yeah. And I know that uh, a book about one discipline them, yeah, is, is, exactly. on your, is on the table. So sure. what, what are they? Well, the, I, I, I picked... Um, yeah, hold I, it up? I, sure. Yeah, I picked three books um, that were both, some of which were influential in this particular book, and then some were just influential to my... Um, to my becoming an historian and how I think about what we do. And I would say that this book, um, it's uh, The Disciplinary Revolution, Calvinism and the Rise of the State in Early Modern Europe by Philip Gorski, who's a sociologist of religion currently at Yale. Um, this book, I think, for me, was, was tremendously influential because what he does is tell a very counterintuitive story and in a way that it kind of winds up what what I hope I did, where you tell a story that where you don't kind of know the outcome before you go through it. And his counterintuitive story is we have this narrative, I'm simplifying, but you have this narrative of secularization and um, as a result of reformation. And what he says is that the the surprising thing about the reformation was that society became more secular while not becoming um, less religious. Uh -huh. That in fact what you're seeing is a kind of dispersal of authority where people start policing themselves rather than being policed by religious right. authorities. And so the, the, he calls that the disciplinary revolution. So it's secular in the sense that the church and state are separated but it's in fact because people are becoming more religious in their, in their um, relationship to mm -hmm. the theology and the discipline. So I thought that, I mean, I think this book is tremendously important and, um, and also um, just innovative in how it uses the sources. Yeah. Uh -huh. And what about um, the other books on, on the table? We, yeah. have two, we have two more. Oh, so sure, yeah. Well, so um, I think Mark Bloch's The Historian's Craft is, um, you know, it's, it's a book that it's hard to even know really where to where to where to start, and, and I think he he puts one of the things that I think is really important for me is that um, I think history is a kind of ethical discipline. I think you know I don't believe that it kind of you can stay remain outside of it as a kind of researcher, um, and he really. Um, positions himself as an historian both in um, the kinds of narratives that we as historians choose and how we craft them but also the kind of ethical project of doing history and that became very unfashionable I think for for several decades he wrote this in during World War II while in um, while he was um, in prison he was part of the French resistance he, had, he was one of the founders of the Annals School and he was um, in the French resistance under Vichy France and then he was actually killed by firing squad but he wrote this um, while he was, um, was was still alive obviously and, um, and, um, and so he was really thinking about the ethics I think uh, very very um, and he was a medieval historian right but he's thinking about you know what w what is the value of doing history when you look around the world you live in and then the, um, the last one is um, this is about the world we exactly <laughs> the passing of that world. Yes, yeah, so it's exactly it's Stefan Zweig's um, "The World of Yesterday," and what I think you know, Zweig is, of course is not an historian; he's a um, he's a, a, a writer, um, but also an, an incredibly astute and sympathetic and um, yeah, just subtle um, contemporary, and that's very rare. And you know, as historians. Um, you know, you would just relish when you get somebody like this who can look at their own time and their own recent history with the kind of distance, the critical distance and, and the kind of uh, nuance that he does. And what he captures is that kind of that moment before, well, b before World War I and then it kind of as it turns into the world of leading into World War II, the passing of this almost kind of liberal utopia that in which a 
a segment of cos what he calls a kind of cosmopolitan Europe lived and believed to be the only you know the only world out there um, completely unaware in a way of what was knocking at the door of different doors right. um, in the f in the you know in the form of various radical ideologies so he kind of captures you know with a kind of irony the, his own naivete growing up in that and being unable to see you know why that kind of um, in a way like preciousness mm -hmm. and isolation is untenable um, in the era of mass politics um, and I think you know this continues to read as tremendously prescient mm -hmm. I think you know I've, I've read it multiple times and every time I'm actually astounded by um, how the echoes that that you see across time so also a tragic uh, fate for the author uh, who actually wound up ultimately killing himself um, years later um, in Argentina, I think, I believe in Argentina. Um, but, uh, but, um, but, you know, had a kind of an attitude toward history and toward what was going on around him that was really a matter of life and death. It wasn't a kind of, you know, a, a profession or a hobby. It was really everything, so. Well, thank you. Well, thank you so okay. much for having me. It's thank a pleasure. You.